Martin McDonough is a filmmaker I have loved for a few years but never considered him one of my favourites. That was until recently when I watched all of his films in one day. There only being 5 feature lengths and one short film, it's hardly a brag but it was my first time seeing a few of them and I had so many thoughts and so many great things to say about the man and his process that I thought I'd do a ranking of his works. This ranking is based off of three things, one, how much I enjoy it as a movie personally, two, how great I think the overall quality is as objectively as possible, though we know it's not entirely possible, it is semi-quantifiable. And three, how much it works as a McDonough film. Now obviously all of these are his films, but he definitely has a style and a sort of niche that he operates within perfectly, no matter the genre or subject. I try to only do the first two in general for other videos and for other review types, but when talking about a specific director's work or actor's work, I think it's important to involve what makes them special enough to make a video about in the first place. So let's just jump into it. Firstly, in sixth place, we have Six Shooter. Now, the sole reason for this being in sixth place is that it is a short. It's unfair to measure it against the other five since they're obviously more thought out, developed and full, but regardless, this short is nowhere near without merit. First of all, Brendan Gleeson playing the protagonist, Donnelly, is perfect. Now, we're going to talk about Gleeson a lot in this video since he is a recurring actor in the filmography, but it is nice seeing him here in such a primitive time in McDonough's works. Just a year off Harry Potter and all the stardom that brought, we're reminded why he's such a legendary actor in the first place. I mean, he brings incredible depth to a character that is severely underwritten, or at least undiscovered. It's a marvel what he does with 26 minutes and a few lines with characters that hold no names. Some of the characters aren't as emotionally profound, but they're still striking for what little screen time they have. It was nice seeing David Pierce and Gary Lydon, who would show up 7 years later in The Guard, and 18 years later in The Banshees of Inner Sharon. The witty writing that McDonough is very efficient with is present from the very beginning of his career as shown here. It's quick, snappy and funny but the emotional beats hit you like a freighter out of nowhere and you never expect it to. But just as easily as he brings those moments in, he removes them with levity just as smoothly. The directing isn't as personal as it would later become but it's fine enough and I'm not sure at all what I was supposed to get from this. This sure, if anything is proof of concept. Proof that McDonough works on a writing level and a directing level. As a storyteller, he was a genius from the start, but as a filmmaker, he was still finding his feet. So that's why I'm giving it a 6 out of 10 for a short. It isn't the same as a 6 out of 10 feature film, but a 6 out of 10 nonetheless. Okay, so at 5 we have The Guard. The Guard is McDonough's sophomore attempt and sadly a step down from his previous film. The setup isn't brilliant or captivating and it's a brutally slow start. Now a lot of McDonough's films could be considered slow burns, but they burn slow and passionately. This film feels like a first edit of a greater attempt at the story. The movie does pick up quite a bit once Don Cheadle's character Wendell enters. The banter between Wendell and Boyle is a large part of why this film works at all. Brendan Gleeson could honestly work with anybody and make it a incredible time. He has chemistry with quite literally every actor he comes across. It's pure mastery. But even that cannot entirely save this film. The story itself is a bore and a drag to get through and the third act isn't as exciting or intense as I feel it should be. Now, pound for pound laughs, this is up there in McDonough's works, but as an entire piece of art, it falls slightly short of great, or even good for that matter. It doesn't feel particularly deep or meaningful, which is, of course, fine in regular cases, but I've come to expect more than a shallow time from McDonough. And maybe there are aspects that I'm missing, maybe there are deeper themes that I'm not getting, but I also don't care to rewatch and understand them, and for that, I'm giving it a 5 out of 10 and putting it in 5th place. In 4th place we have a hot take I believe and that is In Bruges. Now I know this is a very popular film from McDonough, if not his most popularised film in general but something about it just didn't click this time. I know this is and was a lot of people's introduction to the man and honestly I think it's perfect as just that. An introduction. 
It holds everything that McDonough is known for and what he's great at, just in smaller form, like a developing smell of a great homemade dish. Great hints of what's yet to come, but you're not gonna get full from it. But regardless, this film is great at many things, and one of them is withholding just enough information to keep you interested, but not so much that you're lost. The small in-between moments, like the apology to Marie for the message that Harry left, make the characters much more full. They feel less like characters and more like people. People who do things off screen. Small choices like those moments between moments that add no value to the story add so much value to the character work, which is a specialty of McDonough. It's a small but possibly game-changing piece of writing a movie that a lot of scriptwriters forget to do, or are just neglectful of the idea. The characters are also aided a lot from Brendan Gleeson, as previously mentioned, and our first appearance of Colin Farrell. As actors, these two have classic chemistry. I think both of them being Irish truly helps that, but they are just such charismatic professionals. The line delivery on the jokes here are top notch, the best they ever are in any of the films we mention here today, and that is equally matched with the delivery and some of the emotional beats too. Ray Fine shows up late to the party and still steals the show, and when your co-star is Gleason, that is not an easy feat at all. The religious threads are present in mostly all of McDonald's works, but especially here. I think they're stronger than usual here because this film is attempting to deep dive into the levels of morality and judgement, so Bruges serves as a sort of purgatory for all of the characters but especially Ray as he awaits his judgements for his crimes. But the morality bullet doesn't stop at killing children, whether accidentally or not. It follows smaller levels of ethics like hitting women, whether prejudice against dwarfism is okay if he's racist, the ethics of honour among thieves, or living by your own morality code, it all ties into the final judgement allegory, and does so perfectly. All of this is great, and I truly do enjoy this film, however despite its great ideas and often great acting, its execution isn't quite as great. The action is pretty clumsy as far as directing goes, the themes are great but they aren't as refined as McDonough now would be able to shape them. It's a freshman attempt at the McDonough style and it's good, but serves best as a teaser for what's to come. So 6 out of 10 for our 4th place. Ok so 3rd place we have 7 Psychopaths. Now this is the third Martin McDonough feature length film and immediately from the first 20 minutes in you can just feel it's a cut above the previous two. McDonough is a man who takes years in between projects whereas this came out only a year after The God which if you remember is ranked bottom. I think this is because a lot of McDonough's efforts went into this film and not so much The God. For starters, this film has a stellar cast, possibly the best cast he's ever had. Woody Harrelson, Sam Rockwell, Colin Farrell, Christopher Walken and even fucking Tom Waits is in this, and they all do an immaculate job in their characters' very specific roles. Every character is so unlike each other that the fact that they all work together in the same story is a miracle, but it works because this story is so fantastical and almost Tarantino-esque. Now, I wouldn't want to compare, but this film is definitely the most standout genre and tone-wise in McDonough's entire catalogue. But its uniqueness told through the voice of this, well, perfectionist, is what carries it to the finish line. This concept given to a much lazier or just less specific director, then it would be good but just not this good. The Jack of Diamonds reveal was genuinely unexpected and perfectly nonchalant. You aren't expecting the twist at all, obviously, especially not at the moment it arrives, but it's so cavalier with it that it doesn't even feel like a real twist. But the twist goes to the credit of the almost meta nature of this story, which is territory that Martin rarely edges towards. There's no smooth way to segue into this point, so just here it is. The way Christopher Walken says hallucinogens is hilarious. You've just eaten too many hallucinogenic cactuses tonight, Hans. Nothing to do with the hallucinogens. McDonough is known for his unsatisfying endings. It's almost his trademark, but the ending here is unusually satisfying. Everything ties up nicely, which puts you on edge, just waiting for the bad things to happen. 
but it doesn't. Even in the post credit scene, it ends quite peacefully. What I think this film is attempting to comment on is the effects of violence, the toll it can take and the places it can take you. The place of a pacifist among psychopaths and what really makes a psychopath to begin with, what separates them. I think this film is much more layered than it's given credit for and that is why it gets third place and a 7 out of 10. Now second place was tough. I was caught between a billboard and a banshee and both have merits as to why they belong at the top, but eventually I came to the conclusion that second place goes to... Three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri. Now, this is the first and currently only McDonough film without either Brendan Gleeson or Colin Farrell, but we do have Sam Rockwell and Woody Harrelson returning. The film opens in a gorgeous and sombre way, it perfectly sets the tone for the rest of the movie and that matters more than people may think. It lets you know straight away the vibe of this film. There is no foreplay, we know what this film is on and what it's here to do and feel like. There are so many layers to this story like the cancer angle on top of your understanding the lengths of the investigation and why it stopped, the ethics of what she would like to do, but you also understand Mildred's need for justice. You in the end understand why Willoughby kept around Dixon despite Dixon being presented as an awful human being. Willoughby is incredibly perceptive and he saw what we eventually find out at the end of Dixon's character arc. I will say though, there is an uncomfortable amount of n-bombs being thrown around in this film. I understand, but also I kind of wince every time. I love the small town politics we go through, how rumours, lies, accusations and spirits carry through one another in such a small community to the point where people who you've never spoke to have a complete opinion of you through sheer word of mouth. Potentially putting real scrutiny on how we behave and conduct ourselves through all media like news and social media. It holds up an ugly mirror to our social setting and I think it's completely by design. The way characters relate and communicate to each other is vital to the story because it is all character driven. There is no flashy action or overt comedy to keep you invested so it's important that the depths of these characters is felt and understood among the audience. A great example of this is Mildred and Willoughby who don't hate each other at all. They have this wonderful tit for tat but they are simply just two opposite ends of the same goal. This is truly represented during the semi-interrogation scene where the two are playfully playing cat and mouse in a game of he said she said before Willoughby coughs up blood and the mood entirely changes and becomes meaningful on another level. There was an inherent understanding and huge amount of care between them. The family dynamics are just as spectrum filling and exhausting. The cunt joke by the way is a masterpiece. There will be no more cunts in this house, you got that mister? What are you moving out? It was a get. It's a get. It was a gag. Every single character can be understood, empathised with, and sympathised with, which creates this tension among everyone because nobody feels right or wrong. I mean, even Dixon gets a redemption arc in the end, which at first I thought he was completely undeserving of, but then, that's the point, right? Who am I to say that? The tension upholds the entire time up until the final moments. There is comedy, sure, there always will be with McDonough, but it in no way compromises the tension and that's something I've yet to truly commentate on, but McDonough is truly a master at that. He knows how to control the emotions of a scene or sequence so well that the best and most perfect joke can be slid into the highest tension point in a film and it couldn't ruin that scene. He's like the anti-MCU, it would all be as equally every emotion without complicating it all. This film has by far the biggest emotional heartbeat of any McDonough film, even minor characters like Peter Dinklage's James are brilliant and full of history. Another golden example is the ex-husband character who doesn't appear like, hey this is how we feel about each other. It's never said really how they feel about each other, you just know it, it's in how they interact, which the credit goes to both the incredible actors and McDonough's writing. This film has the most unsatisfying end of any movie in this list and it was a bold move to design it that way, but I think it completely pays off. Things don't always work out the way we want them, yet we grow anyway, we deal and we persevere even if we cannot forget. 
This is not the best film McDonough has made, but it is the greatest film in the McDonough style. And that's why it's second place, and that's why it gets a 9 out of 10. Which leaves us with our number one in the Banshees of Inner Sherin. I have slightly less to say about this film because, well, this film is brilliant in simplicity. The beautiful cinematography and Irish village backdrop is truly breathtaking and makes even the most minor of scenes a banquet for the eyes. But that being said, there aren't any really minor scenes. Every scene that you can possibly think of from this film has purpose and has meaning attached to it. That's genius. You couldn't take out a single moment in this film without losing some of the emotional weight and some of the themes. There is breathtaking realism in all of this film's veins, capillaries and arteries. It's pumping through every aspect and even the surrealism has a bitter taste of reality in it. I don't know how, but it does. This, like the other films, has genuine moments of comedy that never break the tension, and a lot of the time the comedy aids the tension itself, which is a difficult balance to maintain. Brendan Gleeson and Colin Farrell are obviously the workhorses that are keeping this thing going because their chemistry, as I said, is wonderful. They just know each other so well at this point, but Kerry Condon is the unsung hero here who gives us much more than is required in her side character's role. Same for Barry Keegan who is insanely annoying but good-hearted and holds together a lot of the scenes he's in despite being faced with these giants of cinema. Now this film is dealing with a lot. It may look like it's standing still but the cogs are turning and it's thinking a lot as it stands still. There's a lot of thought put into the idea of dissonance of long-term friendship, the value of regular conversations, and the understated value of niceness. Niceness doesn't need to be remembered for generations. What matters is how it impacts the now, how it makes those you care for feel. What's timeless art if you're not the one who gets to love it with the ones around you? The Civil War backdrop is particularly interesting on this front, because I understand it's an allegory for the friends in their own personal civil war, but I do think it's interesting that there's a line about missing when the Irish fought the English instead. Like, people long for when they fought a common enemy rather than each other. There is a lot of open-endedness to this film, which is entirely intentional, I'm sure, but I do wish a few things here were wrapped up. Like, the significance of the old lady, or the reason behind Dominic's death. I understand they're intentionally ambiguous, I just wish they weren't. I know I'm supposed to think and get something out of it for myself, but I just want to know. I want to know. Please, just tell me. But those being my only problems, this film is pretty close to perfection, and it's all wrapped up in a brutal third act that is emotionally devastating. Now I've heard the criticism that these characters have no arcs, or that they're shallow characters, but I wholeheartedly disagree. I think one of the main ideas of the film is that there can be so much complexity in the most simplest of people in the most simplest of places. But also granted, even if they were completely one dimensional, which I don't believe they are, I don't think that would make the characters bad or poorly written. This is a side rant, but characters don't need to be multi dimensional to make a story great or with meaning. They just need to serve the purpose of the narrative and messages. I very much doubt that McDonough intended on making characters as bad for being bad's sake and therefore it's okay, I think he made very incredibly real and emotionally cavernous characters. Subtle, but not shallow. This is nothing short of McDonough's best movie and also a 9 out of 10. And that's it. That's every Martin McDonough project ranked and rated. I will be putting this into a list onto Letterboxd soon enough, so when new films arrive I can adjust the ranking accordingly, or if I ever just change my mind, but for now, that's the ranking. So, with all that said, let me know if you agree or disagree, tell me your ranking, let me know what you think of any of these films, McDonough or this video, and whether it be a Martin McDonough original or not. As always, keep watching movies. I can't see, of course you can't fucking see. I just shot a blank in your fucking eyes.